Thanks everybody for coming. This webinar is about the top five ways text-based recipes and APIs take months off your LabVIEW project schedule. I'm Justin Gores, JKI's Marketing Manager. I've also got Jim Kring here with me. He's our CEO here at JKI. Uh, he also wrote the book LabVIEW for Everyone, which you may have heard of. And in a few seconds, I'll be turning the mic over to him to get things rolling. Before we get started, just a couple administrative items I want to talk to you about. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, with webinars like this. Over on the right side of your screen, uh, you probably should see the webinar control panel. In that window, there's a pane uh, where you can type questions or notes. Uh, those will show up on my screen uh, that I'll be monitoring while Jim talks. So if you have a question about anything related to what Jim's saying, just type it there and I'll, I'll see it and do my best to sort it out. If there are questions there that I can't answer, we'll save them for the end and we can hopefully get back and circle around and answer them then. Secondly, we will be recording this webinar and we'll be making it available for viewing after we do a little bit of post-processing on it. You'll receive an email about that as soon as it's available, probably in the next day or so, so you can watch it later or share it with your friends and colleagues who might have missed the proceedings today. And the last thing I want to say is that at the conclusion of the presentation, you'll be directed to a survey page with some questions on it about the about the content of the webinar and what you got out of it, whether it met your expectations, et cetera. Um, it should take you less than five minutes to fill it out. I think I think I put nine questions on it, but most of them are multiple choice. And the information you provide there is super, super use, useful to us in terms of helping us plan future events and making sure that uh, the content we deliver is tailored to exactly what LabVIEW developers and systems engineers like yourselves need and want to see. So enough of all that, uh, let's turn it over to Jim. Take it away, Jim. Thanks, Justin, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. This is my very first webinar. As Justin mentioned, I've been building scientific instruments and systems with LabVIEW for the past 18 years, starting out at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab while I was an engineering student at UC Berkeley. And I'm excited to share with you some of what I've learned over the years and hope to help you take months off your LabVIEW project schedule and help your company get its innovative products to market quickly. But enough about me, let's talk about you. You're a LabVIEW developer, that's why you're here. You help get products to market, you provide software support for one or more stages of the process from research and discovery to design and development to manufacturing and ultimately the servicing of your product in the field. You're good at what you do. You use powerful tools such as LabVIEW and anti-modular hardware for test, measurement, and control. You often look like a superhero to your team members. And, of course, you're very busy. Your team asks for a lot. They've learned to expect you to add new features, create new applications, and help build new systems and you support the team's efforts to innovate new technology and bring it to market. Your team asks you to help in several ways. Extend the capabilities of LabVIEW. Help team members who don't know LabVIEW. Make minor changes to the functionality of the software over and over. Create software to support manufacturing and service, and to do it all over again on the next generation system. You want to respond to these requests very quickly. You want to not be the bottleneck of your product project. But how do we do these things? When JKI talks to customers, they tell us they have these problems. They ask us, how can I make architectural choices that help me not be the bottleneck? We'll talk about these today. But before we get into the specific details of how you respond to all these requests from team members, we need to talk about two key architectural components that make a solution possible. The key components of JKI's solution are to first, expose the LabVIEW application's functionality via text-based APIs, and secondly, to bridge LabVIEW with a general purpose text-based scripting language. Let's discuss these in more details. Let's talk about why text-based APIs are important in systems development. Text-based APIs allow non-LabVIEW applications to control your software. By providing an API that text-based languages can call, you allow basically any external application or language to call into your core system software. All it takes is a simple write wrapper library in whatever language you need. For example, c -sharp, Java, etc. Now, recall that text-based APIs allow applications to control boxed instruments. 
these text-based APIs are nothing new to LabVIEW. Recall Skippy, or the standard commands for programmable instruments. When you send Skippy or GPIB commands down the wire to your Agilent DMM, that's actually text-based APIs wrapped in a VI-based API in LabVIEW. So even though as a LabVIEW developer, you probably think of VI-based APIs, opening your system up with a text-based API really increases the scope and number of things your system can do. One nice thing about text-based APIs is that you can debug them using tools like the NIIO trace, formerly NISpy, and network packet sniffers. Next, let's look at why it's important to bridge LabVIEW with a general-purpose text-based scripting language. But first, let's define what scripting is and what we mean by the term scripts. Scripts are programs that automate the execution of tasks which could alternatively be executed one by one by a human operator. Typically, scripts are small and not too complex. They're often written and executed on the fly, and they're created or modified by the person executing them. This all probably sounds familiar to you, and you may have seen or implemented text-based scripting, sometimes called macros, in LabVIEW applications. In fact, a string-based queued message handler in LabVIEW can be used as a scripting engine. So why use a general purpose scripting language? Everyone's homegrown scripting language executes commands sequentially and will eventually become a maintenance nightmare. If, if you've ever decided to use a string-based queued message handler as a scripting engine, you've seen how your customers, your end users, are often asking for more advanced features over time, such as loops, variables, and things like that. Um, quickly, you're going to become uh, a scripting language author, and it will become a maintenance nightmare. A general purpose scripting language gives you a lot more. It gives you those things your end users are asking for, which is a complete and better programming language. Plus, you get an interactive prompt where people can type in commands and interact with objects within the system uh, very naturally. Okay, so you're convinced not to create your own scripting language. So which general purpose scripting language should you use? Frankly, there are a lot of options. At JKI, we use Python. We think it's great, and our customers love it, too. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So those are the two key components of JKI's solutions, APIs and scripting. Let's look at how they take months off your project schedule. Remember all those requests coming from your team members. Let's review them now. First, let's take a look at how to extend the capabilities of LabVIEW. How do you add capabilities that aren't easy or possible in LabVIEW? LabVIEW is a powerful tool. It's a visual programming environment with lots of great drivers for test and measurement hardware, and its data analysis and signal processing capabilities are awesome. But sometimes you need to do things that aren't easy or possible in LabVIEW, or things that people have already done in other languages which you want to leverage. These might include web service API wrapper libraries for things like cloud computing and cloud storage, or domain-specific libraries such as protein folding or medical imaging. And sometimes text-based scripting and interaction from a command prompt are required or useful to your end users. Doing these things in LabVIEW might take a long time. The good news is many general-purpose scripting languages excel in these areas. Python does. And by bridging LabVIEW and Python, you can save time by leveraging all of this. Again, bridging LabVIEW with a general purpose scripting language like Python can sometimes extend LabVIEW's capabilities more quickly than doing it natively. This can take months off your project schedule. Now, back to our list of team member requests. Let's take a look at how to help team members who don't know LabVIEW. How do you best provide support to these team members who, for whatever reason, can't write LabVIEW code? Let's look at how best to help them. First, we should look at the type of support that they're going to need. Most often, these team members, who are scientists and engineers, need help testing their ideas. They want to quickly evaluate the performance of new 
and potential system components, generate engineering data, characterize the system, and prove their designs. Each new feature they ask you to develop takes time to implement and adds risk to the system. Because the core system software must be very stable, you need to be sure it's well designed and implemented. You need to build and deploy it, then you need to test it to ensure it's functioning properly on all the deployed systems. That's a lot of work, risk, and time, especially when these requests are coming from a large team very quickly. To see if there's a better way to handle these requests for help, let's look at what our team members are really asking for. Often, these requests are for automation of tedious tasks that team members can already do manually using your software. They're often small and not too complex operations, one-off experiments, and the requests are usually communicated to you in the form of pseudocode or text-based code written by your team. That sounds a lot like scripts. So let's help our team members help themselves by allowing them to write scripts to address these rather informal use cases. Now, instead of asking for changes to the system software, your team members can quickly help themselves by writing scripts that call into the system's APIs. This saves incredible amounts of time, and your team members are truly empowered to innovate and test their ideas, because you're not the bottleneck. Now, let's look at how we can save time when we make minor changes to the functionality of the software over and over. What's the fastest way to make frequent minor software changes? We've discussed how changes to the core system software can take longer because it must be very stable and well tested at all times. How can we avoid that extra work for frequent minor changes to the system software? Recall, scripts work great for allowing team members to help themselves and make their frequent minor changes. Scripts can also help you speed up the development of the system software too. By allowing some scripting inside what is considered the system software, you now have a choice. You can make changes to the core system functionality, which can be much slower and need to be very reliable and well tested on all systems. Or you can make those changes to the system scripts, which is much faster and has less risk. Next, let's look at how we can quickly respond to requests to create software support for manufacturing and service. As your company's product moves toward market, you'll need software to manufacture and service it in the field. So what's the fastest way to implement these support applications? When, we're, when we create manufacturing and service tools, we need to communicate with hardware subsystems. We can do this through hardware device driver calls. And we need to be making similar calls as the core system software. This is at best redundant and at worst a whole lot of extra work and risk. It adds a lot of time to the project. Instead, if we can reuse the core system and make API calls to exercise the hardware, we can save considerable time. So we've manufactured our product and created service tools. So what's next? Of course, your team is going to ask you to do this all over again on the next generation system. Now that your product is wildly successful, you need to start working on version 2 with your R&D team. And because you've done this all before, of course, it's expected you're going to be able to develop the product much faster this time around. So what's the fastest way to start the next generation of the product? You could start from scratch. Or, instead, reuse high-level software. You and others on your team have developed, throughout the course of the project, several high-level tools that call into the core system software through its APIs. Now, when you want to rev the system software to version 2, you can leverage uh, the existing APIs and save considerable time by maintaining support for version 1.0 APIs and leveraging all those high-level tools that utilize the API. However, new systems are often different in subtle ways and you'll need to extend APIs to support version 2 specific functionality. 
In these cases, you can define a new version of the API for version 2 tools while still supporting the older APIs and high-level tools, if you so choose. Now you have the tools you need to quickly respond to requests from your team. Each of the five benefits we've discussed impacts one or more phases of the product development process in a way that shortens the time required. You'll save time at each stage of the process from discovery to design to development to manufacturing and service. And you'll save time when you do it all over again on the next generation of your product. You'll take months off your project schedule. You'll look like a superhero. And you'll make your team look like superheroes. Text-based APIs and a general purpose scripting language make this possible. And the fact that you're good at what you do and you combine these techniques with powerful tools like LabVIEW and NI Hardware. So is it really this easy? It does require some novel concepts and architectures. For example, we need a general purpose scripting language like Python. We need to standardize on an API interface, for example, TCP IP, Skippy, uh, REST. We need to know enough about both of these to actually do the work of connecting everything. And we need a LabVIEW architecture that supports this. It will likely be event-driven, asynchronous, by reference. It needs to be modular and extensible. At JKI, we know these things because we've been helping companies do this for many years. If you want to learn more about a specific project we did this on, you can check out our case study. In this example, we helped the company get three sample prep instruments to market in incredible time. So now it's your turn. To get started, we encourage people to jump into Python or a general purpose scripting language they prefer. Learn about Skippy over TCP IP. Implement a simple interface to one module of your software and gradually extend the API to cover more of your application. Involve stakeholders. Build an API that will help them get stuff done so they understand the value. Of course, if that doesn't work, or if you're in a hurry, as many of JKI's customers are, you can call us and we can definitely help you. We hope this helps you be an architect and not a bottleneck. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Well, that concludes uh, the main part of the webinar here. Um, I have a couple audience questions, Jim, that I want to run by you if that's okay. Sure. Um, so the first one, and it actually goes to the slide uh, about now it's your turn. Um, these came up earlier, but but then that slide really hit them. Um, I, one of the one of the attendees here asked, uh, as someone coming from a lab view basically like a pure lab view background and i'm embellishing the question a little bit um what would you say is the best way for someone to start getting their feet wet with with python um there are a lot of online courses for python um some even for example called uh, learning to program using python um, which, which might be kind of the best um, place to start. Um, there are a lot of uh, good books you can read as well. Um, Introduction to Python, I think, is one. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, Py one of the things I like about Python is that it's very light on syntax. Um, we, we, as LabVIEW programmers, kind of make fun of um, text-based programmers and their curly braces and semicolons. Python doesn't have those. Um, Python also has an interactive prompt, um, which to me feels a lot like, you know, when I hit the run button on a VI, I can quickly run run uh, a few nodes and test my data inputs and my results. Um, Python's interactive mode is a lot like that. So I think the best way to get started, um, uh, Python Win is uh, a Windows kind of uh, installation for Python that includes a bunch of um, kind of higher level tools, installs everything where it needs to go. Um, that's kind of where I would get started. Uh, plus maybe an online course that guides you through that setup process. Someone else here in a, in a comment that they sent me suggested codeacademy.com. I yeah. guess I'm not actually familiar with that personally, but I guess that's another place to look. And um, if, if you have a Mac, like um, some people do these days, I think it's even automatically installed. You just pop open a terminal and type Python. 
right, right. I can attest to that. Um, we got a lot of questions coming in now. Um, what I'm just going to read this one. Um, what is your preferred command interface? Uh, and I think this is probably for the the text based API receiver um, on the LabVIEW side. Um, asking, is it like REST? Is it? Uh, it says CMD, but I guess that's just commands. Um, I, I think the question is, how does the back end of the of the text based API work on the LabVIEW side? Um, there are a couple different options. Um, the three that um, I've used the most and we've used the most at JKI are um, a, a Skippy based interface um, because it tends to be rather simple while still being quite powerful. Um, the next one, um, REST I think is especially helpful for um, when you need to communicate, for example, if you need to put like a web front end on top of something or you need to communicate um, much more rich data structures between two applications, meaning the API is much more extensive um, because it allows compound data structures to be transferred very easily. I guess an, an equivalent would be like Skippy is a lot more like INI config files. Um, REST is a lot more like XML files in terms of the richness of the data. The third option um, is actually um, we implemented a much more kind of native uh, Python LabVIEW um, bridge that actually um, does not go through sort of Skippy as a protocol. It has a much more um, kind of low level, high performance protocol that's custom. So those are kind of the, th the three that, that I have experience with extensively. Great. Uh, someone else says, uh, so I know LabVIEW and Python, but where should I get it started with the integration of the two? Can you talk to that, Jim? Sure. Um, I, again, I think for starters, to do it yourself um, would be to um, imp, imp, expose a, a protocol. LabVIEW allows you to build a web service built into it. Um, or you could um, build your own simple uh, Skippy command server that's listening on a TCP IP port. It receives uh, a command or a query, parses it, sends back a response. I know that there are some simple TCP IP examples available. Um, and then on the Python side, um, you would need to um, open a socket, send the command, parse the response. Uh, Python also has libraries for communicating with a REST server and doing XML parsing. And so um, if, if the parsing and TCP IP side of things, if you don't want to get into that, I guess I would say start by building a, a web service, a RESTful web service in LabVIEW. That's a build specification type. And then on the Python side, you could use some of the more built-in libraries for calling that web service. Great. We're, we're actually losing ground on, on the questions here. Um, let's see. I'm just, just going to sort of pick some. Um, and Jim, I'm not sure if you'll know about this or not. Uh, someone a few minutes ago asked, what about TCL and TCL, uh, yeah. if you say so? Can you, can you offer a comparison between TCL and Python? Um, I, I haven't used uh, TCL much, but I've um, people who have been into it um, have conveyed that it's great. But no, I don't have any direct experience. All right, so that's not what we use. Um, quick question, Python version 2 or 3? I probably could have answered this privately, but it doesn't matter, right? Um, well, so I guess what I would say is, you know, for your own work, it might not matter if you're experimenting with it. If, if this is something that you're looking to deploy more widely, um, I think that the version 3.0 is still, even though it's been out for a little while, considered relatively new. Um, when you pop open a Mac terminal, I think it's like 2.7 point something. Um, I, I think that um, generally the mainstream of what's considered stable is in like the 2.7. 
Um, and I know that some tools are, are still not yet officially supporting 3.0 if you're in, intending to call uh, external libraries and things like that. Oh, here's a good one. Um, where is a good place to start in terms of what functions to expose when first building out your API? That's a really good question. Um, I, you know, and I think it points to the fact that as a software developer, you are an API designer. And so this isn't, um, th this question is a little bit more um, general purpose around sort of good API design. Um, I, which things to expose first? I guess given, given the use cases that I've been describing, um, which is basically using, using a general purpose scripting language like Python as a script engine or a macro engine for your users would be to expose functionality that users can do um, through the front panels of your, your application. And so when you give this tool to your users, they, are, they already know what they can do with the front panels of the software. And now you've given them an API so that they can write their own scripts to do these things programmatically. So uh, a great example is a mechanical engineer um, basically wants to open and close like a sample tray, sample holder tray on an instrument. Uh, he's, he or she's working on the mechanical design, put in a new limit switch, and they want to move it, open and close it a thousand times overnight. Well, you know, they could brew up a big cup of coffee and sit in front of the software and click the open tray, close tray button on the front panel a thousand times, or they could write a simple script that does that, checks the limit sensor, and if the limit sensor ever sort of fails, uh, abort the test, send themselves an email and stuff like that. So uh, again, automate the things that the users can already do uh, at, at the high level. Thanks. Um, let's see, someone pointed out the major disadvantage of Python 3 so far is lack of third-party libraries. Um, I guess I, that doesn't surprise me when I've used it. Um, let's see. Oh, what if my device is a microscope that acquires, uh, that acquires streaming images? Is Skippy okay for that? Um, how fast do you want to stream these images and how large are they? Um, and that's sort of a rhetorical question. Um, when we get into streaming images, um, you know, kind of the next question would be, um, you know, how is this image data encoded? Um, you know, is it going to be hex encoded? Um, it, I, I will respond to that question and say, in general, if you're transferring kind of binary data and you're streaming data, um, Skippy might not be um, the, the best tool for that. You get into issues where, um, so imagine through the API you want to stream images, but at the same time you want to make other calls into the API while the images are streaming. Now, now you have kind of two concurrent things, and traditionally um, Skippy APIs tend to be very synchronous, meaning you have to wait till one command finishes before you can send another one. Um, there are ways to do asynchronous stuff. Um, I know, for example, um, certain Visa uh, protocols have support for actually sending some asynchronous kind of triggers and messages on, on the line um, while blocking tasks are occurring. So yeah, that gets into some interesting questions. Um, one other, you know, option that you can do is if, if you do need to stream images, let's say your protocol supports that and it's synchronous, um, you might open a separate TCP IP socket connection specifically for the streaming of your images and then use, uh, use a, a different socket connection for your, um, kind of very short, um, command response stuff that's happening repeatedly while those image streaming uh, are occurring. You bet. Here's a good one. Um, and I'm just going to read, I'm going to read it and, and translate it just a little bit. Um, someone is asking about our colleagues and clients who don't know LabVIEW. What about if they just, or how about they just learn test stand? And so they can choose what they want to run in terms of sequences and test steps instead of asking us for LabVIEW customizations. Um, I guess the question there is uh, why, why a generic 
API and bridge to something like Python um, when you can do a lot of the same things in test standard? Um, well, so I think um, Python is definitely lightweight. Um, for example, it it's already installed on my Mac. Um, it's uh, you know it has a low barrier to entry um, for people. It's you know they can download it and install it. Um, I guess the I'm trying to think um, and. The other thing too is for a lot of these applications, um, you know, these are basically for um, recipes and executing kind of macros and automating things that they could normally do. And so this this isn't really um, we haven't really seen our customers using this for test executive uh, functionality. It's basically just being used to automate, um, you know, simple simple tasks um, or 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 automating things within the core system software uh, that might need to change relatively frequently or in subtle ways um, like like a recipe like a sample preparation recipe might um, I hope that answers the question so and actually I'll just I'll just point out all of these questions um, if we're missing something or if we don't answer a question quite right absolutely put that in the survey. Uh, the survey questions at, at the end there's a one of the questions is basically a text box that says tell us anything you want to tell us um, anything you put there we will definitely read and and if we're if we answer a question wrong or sort of miss the point we want to know that because we can definitely follow up um, someone asks uh, does my lab view need to be fully state driven uh, like norm's top level baseline I think TLB um, so a script wouldn't be allowed to give a command that's not allowed at a given state basically is it does your lab view code need to be essentially a proper state machine um, in order for this to in order for this to work correctly that's a good question um, when we typically um, so I, I guess the question would be that that kind of depends and I don't think it necessarily requires that at all. Um, what will often happen in our applications is that or is that we will we will have an a LabVIEW VI based API um, for for various subsystems of, of our application. And what we'll essentially do is we'll have a, a Skippy command or a Python command that is kind of a one to one mapping between um, the text-based API and the VI-based API in LabVIEW. So essentially, um, in, in the case you, you mentioned kind of this state machine and sending a command when it's not in the right state, uh, a VI-based API into that state machine or actor or whatever, um, the VI-based API would probably return an error if you told it to do something that it wasn't in a state that it could do. Um, and when we put that VI-based API call um, kind of behind uh, a text-based API, uh, we would expect an error to be returned um, through the text-based API um, if that call is made when it's in a state uh, that it couldn't do it. So we might have a text-based uh, command called get state. Uh, so you can actually query if it's in the right state. And then if you make a call to perform an operation and it's not in the right state at that point in time, it would just return an error in an error code through the text-based API. Here's a good one. Uh, someone just said, I'm still not sure what the, what the role of Python is here. I can pass anything to LabVIEW from a command prompt or through a DLL. Yeah, that's that's very true. So um, in that case, you can um, let let's talk about passing it through a command prompt, and and I think that that was presented as being an alternative to Python. Um, you could, if you have the ability to send commands through a command prompt, you could write a batch file in Windows. Uh, if you're on Linux, you could write a shell script. Um, on Mac, you could do something similar. Um, you could, yes, you absolutely could build a DLL and call that from your application. I guess one of the differences between the DLL is that um, the text-based APIs, especially if they're TCP, IP-enabled pipe, um, can work 
over the network, um, which allows you know different computing environments to to talk to each other. Um, the DLL based solution is kind of a Windows specific thing um, as well. Um, the other thing too that's a little bit different between the two things that were presented, sort of a command line interface and a DLL based interface, what does Python give you is the ability to um, do some programming, some simple programming. For example, uh, in Python you could um, do a loop uh, that cycles, makes calls into that um, sample tray to open the tray, check, check the tray open sensor close the tray, check the tray close sensor, and you could loop that um, until there's a failure or until it's gone through a thousand cycles, um, and then you could make a function call to send an email to yourself um, when that finishes. Uh, and so again, it's a general purpose programming environment that allows you to actually do some scripting uh, and, and a command prompt interface uh, that's just executing a text command per se. Um, that's kind of the API level uh, feature, but um, the general purpose text-based scripting language gives you a lot more. Here's a good one that I actually don't know the answer to. Um, someone asks, how do you distribute this API to Python developers? Noting that this probably, that, that Python extensions and add-ins probably aren't intended to go through VIPM. So, so the question is, once we sort of expose this API, you know, this uh, a Python interface or whatever, um, how do yeah. the Python guys or or anything? And it's important to note here. Sure. I'll just add this that that we talk about Python because we love Python, but this isn't actually limited to Python. This is sort of anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a this is a really good question. Um, so if if we were just exposing a text-based API without actually sort of the language bindings like the Python bridging stuff. Um, we would probably just give them a document that that lists the, the commands um, that we support, like the REST commands. Um, you could, if it was a REST API, you could use web service descriptor language that describes all the methods and properties. Um, if it's Skippy, um, you might have you know a document on each command plus some simple examples people could copy and paste, like you might see uh, in a manual for a boxed instrument. You could look at those as, as an example. Um, if, if we're distributing it with language level support, like a Python library for making a connection, what I would probably do is in, in the build of my executable application, I would include um, what's called a, a module, which is a .py file, which are kind of your core scripts that basically open the connection to the, the text-based API in LabVIEW, open the connection, implement the commands, provide sort of the Python methods that map into the um, text-based API calls, of course, that map into those VI-based APIs in your application. So basically that Python module would get bundled into your application build so that it would be installed on the uh, end user's computer uh, who then would have Python installed, you might even bundle the Python installer into your application's installer, and then um, you could tweak the, um, the, env the environment, system environment paths in Windows, so that when somebody pops open a terminal and types Python and then does an import um, your software, uh, which is your module for connecting to your software that has your APIs, it just works, and then they, you know, type, you know, your software dot method name parameters, hit enter, and it sends the command directly to your application. Of course, you can use VIPM to uh, package Python scripts as well, so might try that. So, so email Michael about that, and and the guy that asked oh, that, I won't I won't read his name here, but um, but you can you can email Michael and ask him. <laughs> um, so uh, here's another good question: How would you go about it the other way around? Uh, i.e. controlling an already implemented piece of Python software from a LabVIEW front panel? I have a feeling That's the answer really is it depends. That's a really good question, yeah. It, it definitely depends. Um, 
you can execute the scripts uh, from the command line. Um, you can pass them arguments as well that the Python script can um, access. Um, you can, you know, call into the Python uh, DLL and open a session that way. Um, I did some work uh, previously with somebody uh, on a tool that exposes Python via a, a LabVIEW script node um, and a set of VIs that can interact with the Python uh, interpreter, dynamic interpreter that way. So there's a lot of options there as well. Someone comments that your presentation graphics are cute. Thanks. Thanks. Um, <laughs> We aim to please. Um, so I actually made a comment on this in the chat. Um, a few people have, have said that they wish that the content of this presentation would have been more demo heavy or more technical. Um, and that's absolutely a fair point. Um, you know, that doesn't surprise me. The The point today has been to give a high level treatment of, of these ideas and sort of these, uh, these principles. Um, if you are wishing, if you find yourself wishing that there was more technical content, um, absolutely put that in the survey results. That is, in fact, what the survey is for. Uh, and we will review everything that everyone says to us, good, bad, and ugly. And um, we definitely are looking at providing more, you know, more content along these lines. Um, you know, and if you tell us what it is you want to see, what problems you're trying to solve, that will help us. Uh, that will help us decide that there are people out there who want to know more about this. Um, let's see. What else are we doing here? And we're actually a little over time, um, so we'll probably be wrapping it up in a couple minutes. Um, someone says, if you make an EXE, then I guess you need a LabVIEW runtime engine installed. That's generally true, yeah. Um, Ooh, this is a this is a long question. I'll just read it. Uh, it says, "What if you need to dynamically launch recipes that an engineer not familiar with any software defines? Uh, for instance, you need to design a production tool for what the line manager would like to would like to create a recipe for on his computer, um, but he basically doesn't know how to do that. Would you create a protocol to translate what he specifies in the API?" and then run that script in your production software. I, I think that, I mean, it, does that make enough sense for you to answer it, Jim? Do you want, do you want to field that? That was a long question. Yeah, <laughs> since I can, since I can reread it because it's on my screen. Um, so basically, I, I think the issue here is, the question is basically, how do you, how would you use this for someone who has uh, essentially no experience writing software? Um, and actually there was another question earlier that I didn't read um, about, why would you have your scientists learn another language when they already are familiar with using text files and CSV files and stuff? Um, and this is a this is a, a good place to point out that again that Python is not just the silver bullet here. It just happens to be what JKI uses. In any given organization, the key here is like the last slide that it, that Jim has up says is to be an architect, not a bottleneck. And if you have scientists or, or system designers or whatever on your team who basically are feeding you requests and then are waiting for you to get around to implementing their software, that's a bottleneck. And um, we like to try to steer people to Python because we know enough about Python to support them in doing it. Inside your organization, if you have guys that like to write in QBasic for, <laughs> for all I care, right? Um, you know, basically the idea here is, is to approach your software design from a standpoint of exposing the functionality that your scientists or your R&D people or your system designers can use in a way that's most comfortable to them. And if they like writing um, scripts in their own custom language that they've come up with, then absolutely more power to you. There's There are limitations to doing that because the language you create from scratch honestly probably isn't going to be very good because you're not a language designer whereas something like python is a sort of fully fleshed out very robust language but if the needs of your project are such that you don't need uh that you don't need that complexity then absolutely you can you can do something more simple and see how far it gets you and then hopefully if your software is sort of modular enough or if your api is well designed enough you could actually translate it to something else like Python or or C sharp or something if, if you needed to later. Hey Justin, so, I had a yes. really quick response to that great question. Uh, I think I think basically the way that I would say it is you can create a Python script which is nothing 
but a sequence that has a command on each line uh, with some arguments and you can um, you know somebody who doesn't know any programming can understand that um, and then from that they can start to build up um, simple you know programmatic structure oh you know wrap this entire thing in a for loop okay they understand that and often we'll give people without much programming experience a simple example script um, and uh, it's very light on syntax and so it's, it's pretty easy for people to understand who don't know programming they don't need to know object orientation and, and how to define new methods uh, and I think we'll maybe make this the last question because it's a great question that that uh, we actually hear from from people periodically. The question is, why not teach them LabVIEW instead of Python? Yeah, that's absolutely a great question, um, and we do that. Uh, in one of my slides, um, when we were talking about uh, VI-based APIs, um, or when we introduced text-based APIs here, um, we see over here that LabVIEW is one of the options. And in fact, uh, LabVIEW code uh, through Visa, you can make Visa calls and call into those text APIs just like you can when you call a boxed instrument. Um, I think, um, so teaching, teaching people LabVIEW is, is, is part of the solution to making them more successful. Uh, if there's a mechanical engineer and um, they need to move the, the tray in and out um, and they need to get this done tomorrow, I can say, you know, uh, you've got choice A and choice B, you know, you can do either one you want, I'll, I'll help you either way, we'll enroll people in LabVIEW courses. Uh, that's definitely an option. There are some people, you know, believe it or not, not who, who feel that, you know, they're better at writing some text-based programs. Um, you know, there's engineers who have uh, taken, you know, introductory programming courses while they're in school and, you know, they learned a little C or Java and picking up Python is, you know, they can look at it and pick it up in 30 minutes and so that's easy for them and that's kind of their choice. And so um, basically the, the idea is we're helping people help themselves um, some people uh, are, are just way more interested uh, in uh, doing kind of a text-based approach um, and actually that kind of uh, kind of helps bridge them into kind of our circle by supporting them uh, it kind of engages them in a conversation um, and so I, I think they're not at all mutually exclusive options um, I think the idea is this extends possibilities rather than sort of giving people a, a choice A or a choice B Great. And with that, um, I think we're probably going to wrap this up here. We were not able to get to all the questions. Um, if you have a, an important question that you didn't get answered, absolutely, again, put it in the survey and we can follow up privately. Um, it, it's not because your question is not interesting or important. It just sort of gets lost in the in the in the crowd a little bit um but if you put it in the survey we'll definitely see it um so i want to thank everybody for coming uh i hope you've all gotten some great information out of this and that it's spurred you to at least think differently about how you approach your software or maybe it's confirmed that you're already doing exactly the right thing and, and really getting stuff done um and supporting your team and making them awesome um, like I say, when you quit the webinar or when I end it in a few seconds, uh, you'll be bounced to our follow-up survey. Definitely fill that in. It would mean a lot to me personally if you would take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, and it helps us do better content and, and help, all of, uh, help all of you help each other in, in better ways. Um, from there, like I said, if there's something you'd like to follow up on with us, uh, any comments on the webinar or any projects you're working on that, that you would like some advice on uh, or just want to, you know, get in touch and tell us about it, you can do that by going to jki.net. Uh, there's a contact link at the top of the front page. Uh, from there, you can submit the contact form, which lands on one of our engineers, um, or you can just send us an email directly at info at jki.net. Uh, thanks again for attending, everybody. I hope you've had fun, and um, get back to work. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.